So I'm going to go through a lot of the common, probably just three of the most common um, psilocybin mushrooms in Australia that you might find in some of the different climates here. Um, and also some of their lookalike species, particularly the, the couple of major toxic ones that you might particularly want to avoid and how to identify um, all of the above. So in Australia, we've got at least 26 species of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, worldwide, it's, it's quite a large genus. Um, some of these will probably eventually be moved out of the genus because they're not actually psychoactive. So just because they're in the genus doesn't mean they contain psilocybin. Um, that's a, a list of the ones that we do have here. If anybody wants a copy of it, let me know. And this is the other common psychoactive genus in Australia, um, Panaeolus. This has uh, the blue manis or Panaeolus cyanescens that grow in some of the tropical climates. The ones underlined in blue there are the, the psychoactive species that are, are known and are on this list. There are probably a few other species of this around as well, but records of fungus in Australia are patchy at best, um, and there hasn't been a great deal of particular interest in the psilocybe genus and the Panaeolus genus here. Um, so we have a lot of information from citizen scientists, which I think is why it's really important for people to actually get out and look for these things. and. Um, put their records up on the, the websites that actually record where people have found um, certain species. These are the ones that I want to talk about today. Um, so Psilocybe cubensis, um, initially named in 48. Suboriginosa is probably the one that most Sydneyites will be more common with. It's one of the temperate species that we have here. It's what's fruiting at the moment. And um, Panaeolus cyanescens, um, that grow in the, the tropical climates. This is a table with some of the um, comparative information on these species, where they grow, what they grow from, um, what time of year they grow, and a rough idea of where they grow, which again is really tenuous information at best. Um, the subreginosa grow in the temperate climates. They grow in eucalypt or in plantation pine forest, so native or introduced. Um, they are a native species. They also grow in wood chip beds in a lot of the colder places in the city. Um, and they have a tendency to like roadsides or disturbed habitats. The other two, um, cubensis and cyanescens, they tend to grow in pasture land, um, where there are cows or horses or sheep or something like that. Um, Subreginosa, again, more um, temperate climates, so they're decaying wood and plant matter and stuff. They are both saprotrophic species, so they grow in decaying things, not in a relationship with tree roots like some of the other species. Um, the cubensis and the cyanescens grow on dung, pretty much just dung. Um, it doesn't have to be fresh. The um, cold weather subreginosa, they don't necessarily need rain. Often after frost is enough to get them started. It just needs to be moisture in the ground um, and high enough humidity. So it doesn't matter where that humidity comes from. Uh, the other ones, warmer weather, better after rain because that's when it's humid in the warmer um, conditions. And when you are, or if you are out looking for them, as a, a general rule, they like places where there's going to be a, a microclimate with even more humidity than there is um, in the open air. So in tufts of grass or under patches of fern or bush where the humidity sort of tends to accumulate a little bit. You see there's probably a species of psychoactive or psilocybin mushroom in most of the states in Australia. Um, tropical for the ones on the right and the temperate on the ones on the left. This is a bit about the anatomy of the mushroom um, and some of the features that are important in identifying a mushroom. Um, so generally speaking, you know, size, shape, colour, relevant to the, the cap or the pileus and the, the stem or the stipe. Um, whether they have gills, which the psilocybin mushrooms all do, or pores or teeth or something else underneath that release spores. Um, the presence or absence of a, a partial veil that covers the gill surface when they're young and developing, and the annulus or the ring that is left around the stipe when that veil breaks is an important feature. Some mushrooms don't have them, some do, and they can come in a fair, fairly wide variety of forms, or um, some are very thin, like you'll see later, and some are quite membranous and thick. Uh, 
and the presence of a universal veil or a vulva, that's a, like an egg-like structure that actually covers the whole mushroom when it's young and breaks as it grows, often leaves patches on the, on the cap. So you see that in the red and white Amanita muscaria, like the, the Mario mushroom. Um, important to look for that. You, you will never confuse the poisonous Amanita species for one of the psychoactive psilocybin mushrooms. But a lot of the most toxic mushrooms that you'll come across if you're looking for edible mushrooms out there, which I encourage everyone to do, um, will have a, a universal veil and a vulva as well. So it's important to look for that. For that reason, it's always a good idea to fully excavate a mushroom when you're trying to identify it the first time. That involves sort of digging the whole thing up, base and all, so that you can really see all the features. The spore colour is a really important feature to look for. It does not vary. So, I mean, a lot of these other things can be varied depending on the condition of the mushroom, whether it's old, young, whether it's been in the rain, whatever. Spore colour doesn't change. And it's a quick way to rule out a whole bunch of stuff that you don't want to kick or possibly accidentally consume. Um, the feel and the texture of a mushroom can be pretty relevant. Generally comes more with experience and getting out there and touching the mushrooms, obviously quite difficult to describe. Um, and the taste and the odour, don't eat a whole unknown mushroom to tell what the flavour is, probably a bad idea. Um, thanks to the ancient people that tried it for us. But um, just, you, you can safely nibble on any mushroom, get it on your tongue and spit it out so that you get some idea of the flavour. The psilocybin mushrooms do not have a particularly distinctive taste, but if you put something in your mouth and it does, you have a pretty good idea that it's not what you're looking for anyway. And um, the bruising is obviously something that everybody knows about. The psilocybin mushrooms um, do bruise blue. We don't know why it is. There are some you know, theories about whether it has actually got something to do with the presence of the active chemicals or not. Probably not. Um, shows what we know. This is the, the technical terms for the gill attachment and the cap shape. Don't feel intimidated that you need to learn all of this. And that's probably one of the things starting to get into mushrooms. Is you'll read these descriptions that have a lot of you know weird terms that you've never heard unless you've sat in a really weird biology class. Um, uh, sorry, that one's a bit, a bit hidden on that side. But it, just to give you some idea of the, the variety, Basically, you'll see for the three species that I'm discussing, they all have some sort of attached gill. So it attaches to the stem, but does not run down the stem. So broadly speaking, I'd divide that gill attachment thing into three, and it's, it's gills that don't attach to the stem at all. They're free from it. Gills that do attach to the stem to some degree, but don't run down it, and the decurrent gills that actually run down the stem quite a long way. So. The two that are underlined are the, those two that are underlined there, um, they uh, are the ones that are sort of common in the three species that I'll be talking about. Um, can't really see the, the cap shape, but convex is probably the most common, so it can be sort of flatter on the top, but with convex edges, or um, yeah, like that. The umbo, You'll see some of the species do sort of have a bit of a, a nipple on the top that's often fairly distinctive. Um, we'll start talking about Psilocybe subreginosa. Um, pronunciation, maybe I'm not doing it right. But the, um, the cap of it, oh, so for every one of the mushrooms I'm talking about, I'm just going to divide it into the, the cap, the stem, the gills, and that, so that you can see the, the features of it. Um, the cap of this is a fairly uh, a larger, medium-sized mushroom um, that is initially very conical, so sort of a, a semicircular um, shape. Flattens out, becomes convex, and eventually becomes totally flat with upturned edges that get quite wavy. You can see in some of the larger specimens there. This picture shows some of the, the way that it is when they're smaller. So it's sort of conical like that, little pin. Becoming flat and then becoming larger and, and wavy like that. Um, caramel brown or light tan, often light tan when they're a little bit drier. Um, this again sort of shows some of that colour variation quite well. And they're um, hygrophonous, means that when they're wet or dry they change colour. So you can see that 
here, the edge of its darker, uh, center of its lighter, and it's got that sort of graded color change. Um, so it's, it's a good idea when you're looking for mushrooms or trying to identify them to try to find a few specimens of the one in the one area so that you can see if, you know, how the color changes in different ages, otherwise you can get a bit confused. Um, the margin striate when wet, that means you can see the gills through the edge of the, the cap when it's wet, so that you can actually just see sort of little stripes on the edge of it. I don't really see it particularly well on this one. Um, Subreginosa does not have a very membranous partial veil, so that annulus, um, the ring around the top of the, the stem is very flimsy, often not there, not a very um, useful feature. If it is there, then it's, it's handy. If it's not, which it often isn't, um, yeah, I wouldn't rely on it too much. The cap does bruise blue as well. Often you'll see that if it's been water damaged or bitten by bugs or um, if your kangaroos had a, a bite of it, which they do. This is how they look when they're younger, mostly, so the, the sort of conical shape. You can see here that's the partial veil there that's running up that will cover the gills until it breaks. They start out quite small like that um, and you know, will eventually flatten out to that sort of shape. These are older ones, just to again show some of the colour variation particularly. So you know, you've got your caramel and brown ones there and then these, which are a really dark caramel colour. Um, the reason it's important to know that they do vary that much is that those ones on the right there, when they're that colour, look very similar to what the poisonous gallerina species tend to look like. They tend to be a darker caramel orange sort of colour like that. So it's important to know that they do vary and get a lot of overlap with one of the potential poisonous species. The gills, um, initially cream tan, so that sort of colour, uh, and becoming a, a darker brown violet, which you'll see some photos of a bit later on. Um, like I said, add an extra adenate attachment, so the gills do attach to the stem. Um, that is the partial veil up close. You can see it's quite flimsy, I mean, you can almost see through it. So that, compared to some other mushrooms, is really quite um, flimsy. It's called coordinate because it is like a web-like one that's referring to another genus, but that's reasonably distinctive. If you see a really thick white partial veil on a, a mushroom, it's not one of these. Um, close or crowded, hard to sort of judge unless you know your mushrooms. They don't branch, so the, the gills will not fork. They're always just a straight line to the edge. The stipe, which is the stem, um, it's mostly white. Sometimes they get a bit of a tan and colour on them from wood or stuff that's lying around them. When they get a bit older, they can get a little bit um, yellow or brown, but not massively. They're mostly white. Um, striate means it's got sort of little lines running down it. That's quite noticeable when you actually see them out in the wild. They really do have these fine lines running down them that can often sort of spiral around the stipe. Um, it's solid when you break it, it's not hollow, um, and it's quite fibrous, so when you snap them, they will not snap cleanly, they won't snap completely. It's a bit like snapping a green branch, you'll end up with sort of fibres that remain connected, and they, they can be quite hard to break. Um, the, like I said, presence of a, a annulus, remnants of the partial veil, if they are flimsy, they get washed away, they fall off with age, it's not reliable to assume that they will have an annulus, but it does mean if you see something that has a proper annulus, a proper ring around the top, it's probably not one of these. Um, the thing to look for at the top of the, the stipe is you can often see spores that have fallen onto the top of the stipe or the top of the stem. And that'll give you some idea of what colour the spores are. It can save you from having to do a spore print later on and can make it a lot easier to identify in the field. Um, we'll talk about what colour the spores are in a minute. The um, subreginosa also have a real tendency to grab whatever they're growing on quite firmly. Um, if you have ever picked one, often you feel like you're pulling sort of half the forest up with it. Uh, they really do hold on to whatever they're, they're growing off. And you can see in the picture as well, there's a lot of mycelium growing on the base of it. You can actually see the sort of root structure, it's actually the, the main component of the organism, these are just the fruit. 
you can see them growing off the bottom of the stylet. With other mushrooms, that's often not as prominent. So it's just those are useful features to look for. You'd never use that as the one thing to identify your mushroom with, but they are just useful, useful features. They do bruise blue, it varies a bit. Um, can often be quite delayed, dry species, wetter species, it, it may not even happen. Um, but if you find a gilled mushroom that bruises blue, there's only one other genus in Australia, which is fairly uncommon, that, that bruises blue that is not a psilocybe. Um, and they've got yellow gills. So if you find a gilled mushroom with sort of this browny grey gill structure that bruises blue, it's a psilocybe. Um, to make it easier, that's the spore colour. Um, it is a dark violet brown. When it's a, that's a, a spore print, um, you take those by cutting the cap off, putting it onto a piece of aluminium foil or paper, covering it with a, a cup um, and leaving it for a couple of hours to overnight depending on the mushroom. Um, don't leave it too long or it will just turn to mush in the cup. And it gives you the, the spore colour. Um, and like I said at the start, spore colour is a non-variable identification feature that will give you a really good suggestion of what genus you are looking at because every genus has a different colour of spore print. Um, and there aren't actually that many other gen uh, genera that have a violet brown sort of spore print like this. So that is useful. Like I say, look at the upper stem and you'll often see some, some spore deposit on that as well. Um, Lookalikes. So these are Gallerina. Um, they contain, or some of these at least, contain amatoxins. Those are the poisonous, really, really poisonous toxins that are found in the death cap mushrooms as well. They will slowly cause liver failure and kidney failure. Um, you, you probably have to eat quite a lot of them for that to be a problem. There haven't been fatal poisonings of these. They're fairly small. Um, that's not to say be, be reckless, go out there, take anything that sort of looks like a sub and eat them. Um, but yeah, they, they shouldn't be enough to put you off going out and looking, I don't think, in a country where it's legal. Um, <laughs> the, um, the two species that you'll commonly see here are Gallerina patagonica and Gallerina marginata. Marginata at least contains the amatoxins. We don't know about patagonica, but it probably does. They look very similar anyway. Um, they can often be found growing literally out of the same clump as, as psilocybin subregionata, so you'll, you'll see them intermingled with a patch of them sometimes. So it is important to be careful to check every mushroom um, when, you are, when you are picking them. Um, the most important and probably way to tell apart from the psilocybin is they have a rusty orange spore colour. Um, and that is often visible on the upper stripe. The gills can still look fairly similar to psilocybin. Um, but they are often more orange. The sky is a deeper orange colour than the usual white of psilocybin. So like I said, even if psilocybin's stem does have some colour to it, it's on a white background. These sort of have that orangey-brown background to start with. Um, they do uh, also have a proper annulus, a true annulus, so a ring around the top of the stripe. You can just see it. So when I said that the remnants from the partial veil on psilocybin subregionosa are really um, sort of friable, very fragile, and often not even present, um, this has a, a proper annulus that can wash off, but if it's there, it's a really easy way to, to differentiate. So the spore colour is the most reliable and the probably easiest way to tell the difference between them. Um, they do have a different feel, again, hard to really compare without feeling them, but they pull out of the ground fairly easily or they snap um, when you're pulling them out rather than bringing out their substrate with them like the subs often do. Helpful feature, but not a feature you would rely on on its own. That's another picture of them. You can see how similar they can look to um, psilocybin subregionosa. But you see here again that that's a, it's a more proper annulus on these and you can actually see this border deposit on, on those pictures. So it is often fairly obvious. 
that's the spore color. Um, which again, you can see how different that is. So if you check those few things, it, it, it becomes fairly easy to tell them apart. It is just important that you always look. Um, these are other similar species to Subaruginosa. Much more difficult to actually confuse these to the point where you eat them. Um, they look quite different. We do still see posts on forums and stuff of people asking, are these subs? Um, so I thought I would mention them. The Radiomyces series grow in, in wood chips mostly. You'll see them a lot in urban environments and garden beds. They have the sort of very similar purple-grey spore print, so spores aren't as useful for telling them apart, but their cap is usually more red like that. They do have remnants of their um, veil on the cap, so little white spots around the cap a lot of the time, um, which subs very seldom have. Uh, Again, very fragile partial bale, often not there. Um, the stipe does get a reddish-orange tint to it as well, which you can see like that, which is, is pretty uncommon on subs. They're also a bit furrier than what a, a sub stock usually is. Um, they're mildly toxic, not, not massively so. And, and, and really, once you've sort of looked at a few pictures and seen them, you won't. It's hard to confuse them. Um, Cortinaria, so I haven't put up pictures because there's biggest, it's the biggest um, genus of macro fungi in the world. Um, all rusty orange spores though, so again, spore colour will rule that out completely straight away. Pyphiloma fasciculari, purple brown spores, one of the biggest reasons that it would be confused for a, a Silas ivy, they've got the same sort of colour spore print. Also grow in the same sort of habitat, but real tendency to cluster, to clump, often can be quite a large clump. And you can see quite obviously here this yellow-green tinge. All right? And that greenish tinge is that greenish tinge is always there um, in these when they're mature. So you will always see that. Again, once you've seen a few subreginosa, you will not confuse the two readily. Um, and you can see that the colour overall is quite a lot more yellow. So moving on to the next species, um, one of the, the more subtropical tropical species, so it's so cubensis. Um, gold tops is often the common name that people have used for them. They're a much larger mushroom overall than um, subreginosa. Uh, initially conical, uh, becoming convex or really broadly convex. They can get quite large, flat with inrolled edges. Um, and they often do have the umbo, so they often do have a bit of a nipple or a bit of a central rise. They can get up to um, 10 centimetres, probably even more across. Um, they vary quite a lot in colour from a, a reddish brown or cinnamon brown um, or deep golden when they're young often, becoming a lot paler as they get older, um, becoming a, a golden yellow or a grey yellow, okay. often with um, this sort of variation in the cap colour with a grey ring around the edge. Gill is much the same, adnate adnex, so attached close and no branching. The um, partial veil on this is more membranous. It's, it's less fragile than on the subreginosa. You'll see it much more clearly. And it hangs around a lot more readily. You can see there, that's the annulus. Um, it's thicker than on the subs. Um, stipe, a little bit more golden. There are probably pictures at the end. Uh, Yeah, it's much the same information as for the subs, right? So the same sort of gill attachment um, and the same colour. And um, yeah, stems a lot thicker than it is on the subs generally. Actually, it can get up to sort of two and a half, three centimetres across. They get fairly tall, 15 centimetres. Subs can get up to about 20 centimetres tall, but they're very skinny. So these are quite quite thick. The as you can see, the annulus on these is really prominent, it's obvious. Right. Spores, same colour. So Solosibi, it's a genus-wide thing. They have the same sort of colour. Um, and the annulus is usually heavily coloured with them. So you can see, really easily see the, the spore colour on that. That's them across the, their age. Really? I'll very, very quickly cover um, Pansionescence. 
much more fragile, much smaller, thin mushroom. Um, obate, so sort of campanulate, so more bell-shaped on the top than the other ones, more rounded. Um, they do not have a nipple, they're sort of a, a smooth round thing. Um, and only one and a half to maybe six centimetres. I don't think I would have ever seen a six centimetre um, wide cap. Light tan brown when they're young, becoming a, a greyish colour um, as they get older, sometimes with dark grey patches. And it's often quite crap. Um, as the name would imply, these become very heavily bruised. You can see the cracking on these. So really obvious, really common. That's the spore colour and they do, they do often produce that really heavy spore deposit on their counterparts that are hanging around them. Again, you can see it's sort of habitat here in the grass. Like I said, grassy tufts are usually fairly prominent. The gills again attached, the same as um, with the psilocybes. And um, a, a light grey to start with becoming darker. They're often mottled, so they're a bit patchy with darker and lighter parts on them. Um, they do not have a partial veil and they do not have an annulus, so the gills are not covered during development, they're open. Um, stipe, off white or a light tan or light grey. Again, fine lines running down it that you can see when you look quite closely. Mostly smooth or finely hairy to the touch. They're hollow um, and they're fibrous as well. So, like I said, they won't snap really easily that you can actually see the, the fibres in them when you break them. Um, very thin and very fragile, so less than half a centimetre thick. Get quite tall, up to um, 12 centimetres and uh, really renowned for bruising a really deep blue cap and stem. So really obvious. Jet black spore print. Um, so for the psilocybes and these, you've either got a purple brown spore print for the psilocybe or a jet black one for um, the pan cyanescence. The only real ones that look like pancyanessins are other panaeolus, none of which are toxic. Um, this is probably the most similar one, panaeolus antelarum. They're thicker, they're larger, they're overall a more substantial mushroom. Um, they do not bruise, and, and that's probably one of the more obvious differences. So they're just larger overall, and they don't bruise. You'll find them in the same habitats and everything. Not toxic. Important thing to remember, considered edible, but not very tasty. That's another picture of those. You can see how much larger they are overall than the, the cyanessins. Um, we do have a lot of psilocybin containing mushrooms in Australia. They're fairly easy to identify once you know what you're looking for, and it really doesn't take a lot to pick up on those key features like the spore colour. Um, which is always important to look for. There's actually few close lookalikes that could be easily confused for any of those mushrooms. Um, the toxic lookalikes are really easy to identify generally, so long as you check the spore colour and get familiar with the overall colour. Um, rely on specific features rather than looking at them generally. So don't just look at some pictures on a Google image search and then go out and pick things that sort of look like that. I think that's where most people come to, to harm is by doing it that way. Look for those specific things. Check the spore colour. Check for a, a ring around the stem or the presence of a partial veil. Um, the old adage is, if in doubt, chuck it out. I, I'd, I'd say just check it out. If you don't know what it is, it's a chance to learn something about whatever mushroom you have picked. So go and ask somebody. There's a lot of forums on Facebook. Um, P-Mans, P-M-A-N-Z is one that I would suggest joining. Um, where loads of people post their finds, you will learn very quickly what is out there, when it's out, and how to identify it. Um, take your finds home with you to identify them, take photos of them, and answer questions that experienced people might ask you um, to look for. And yeah, that's the psilocybin mushrooms of Australia from my perspective. Thank you for listening. The first question, um, are you, Simon, if you have an understanding, would you mind touching on briefly some of the lesser known species that occur in Australia, such as some of the other Panolius, uh, what is it, Sabalutetius, uh, the Gymnopolis uh, perparatus, or maybe the Alitasia as well? Yep. Um, Gymnopolis 
Perfure Artisan and Junior Onus are said to not contain psychoactive components in Australia. So rule those out completely. We don't know why. Um, they don't bruise here, they do overseas. Um, and yeah, so, so far as all the reports have been that, that nobody has found them psychoactive. And apparently they're very bitter. So while they're common, I, I yeah, wouldn't look to that for a source. Um, Alitesia is a, it was originally thought to be very rare actually and not, not widely distributed. They're, they're much smaller mushrooms that don't bruise particularly heavily. They grow in dung, um, wombat dung, kangaroo dung when you're out. Same sort of habitats as Subreginosa. Um, you won't confuse them for um, so, uh, subs or anything like that, but sometimes you will find them in dung. They are not um, strongly active mushrooms and they are tiny. But they're really interesting and it's good for people to record where they're finding them because originally they were thought to only come from sort of Tasmania but they've been found in Blue Mountains, Snow Mountains, Melbourne area, all around. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and even then probably it may not do a whole lot. So, um, you, yeah, they do grow quite gregariously but if you're in the, in the area where you'll find those, you'll find subs if you look hard enough as well. I think that would be the easiest choice. Um, Tasmaniana, Zapricorum, um, and Papuana, they sort of grow um, in, in the mountainous areas up further north, but they're very rare. Um, if you do find some size so ivy that you, you can't completely identify, post it. Um, you know, let, let the people with, with knowledge look at them, put it on shroomery or put it on Facebook. Citizen science has a lot to, um, it can do a lot for field mycology in Australia because it, people are not studying this. So people going out and finding them is a really good way to actually get an idea of what is around, what species we do have. Um, you discover a new species, Yeah, you name it. You, you really could, like it, it, it sort of happens quite frequently. Um, and, and you'll see a lot of the records are really old, right? And a lot of them have only been found once and have only been described once. So where they are, probably a lot of the time they're just getting called subs or called you know, the common mushrooms. That stuff needs to be sort of explored more broadly. So if you are out and you find something odd, put it on the internet somewhere where sort of people can look at it and see. Preserve a specimen, send it to a herbarium, talk to people about getting DNA done on it because that's really easy to do now. It costs about 40 bucks. Lots of people are doing the gene analysis on mushrooms now to get some idea of what we do have um, and, and be involved. Um, I can't talk a lot about pen, sub, sub the artists, yeah. That's all right. Let's move on and try and get a few more questions in. Um, so this question is obviously talking about legal mushrooms which are allowed to pick. Um, you know, maybe some other wood-loving species. Um, what are your best tips for sustainably picking legal mushrooms in the wild? How do we encourage fellow pickers that we may meet uh, in the wild to practice sustainable collection techniques? Um, um, you know, such as what tools do we use, things like that. Yeah, huge debate. Um, some people will crucify you for pulling them out of the ground. <laughs> it, they're mushrooms. The animals don't cut them, the animals don't, you know, selectively pick a few out of a patch, the, the pigs rummage through and destroy the whole patch and they grow the next week. The, the whole organism is under the ground, right? Like the mycelium, the, 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 the largest single organism in the world is a armillaria spe uh, mushroom in, in Oregon. And it, it covers hundreds of hectares, um, thousands even. The, the organism itself is hidden and the fruit are just fruit. Um, you don't kill an apple tree by cutting the apples off the tree. I think that's probably the way that I would look at it. Um, from cultivation of legal mushrooms, right, cutting them opens up vasculature that goes into the body of it, into the mycelium. Pulling it out leaves a colonised surface that is pretty much impenetrable. Like right? that contamination cannot attack an established piece of mycelium unless that mycelium is at the end of its lifespan anyway and was not going to last much longer. Mushrooms grow in cycles. Some things are the first to break down a piece of wood. Once that wood's partially decomposed, something else moves in and breaks it down further and then something else comes in. And that's just their natural cycle. There have been studies done that show that 
pulling them out or cutting them does not make a difference one way or another over the long term. So I think, yeah, that, that's been looked at. And the biology just tells us that it, it, it does not matter. I don't say go out and kick over every mushroom because it's fun to boot <laughs> animators around or anything like that. Um, it's just senseless. Uh, but in picking them, I do not think you need to worry very much that picking, especially these ones that we're talking about, the common edibles and the other legal mushrooms you might be out there picking, I, you don't have to worry that much about damaging them. Remember that you're there one day of their season as well. So you, you're seeing a fraction of what will actually pop up. I think you'd have to try really hard to pick an area dry. Um, and the, the organism's still there. So. All right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relative psilocybin concentrations for each of the species? Which ones are the highest? Which ones are the lowest? Um, what are their relative concentrations? Yep, there's a, there is a chart floating around online from some of the studies. It, it's not something that's been looked at really extensively, but Sabrogenosa worldwide is probably maybe the second strongest in concentration below cyan essence. There are four active um, components in uh, magic mushrooms. So there's psilocybin and psilocin, which is dephosphorylated psilocybin closely related, um, and there's biocystin and norbiocystin that are newer discovered. We don't really know exactly how they act. Um, so looking at all the individual um, concentrations of those, cyan essence, uh, an American mushroom is probably at the top, subaruginosis probably second. Um, Panaeola cyan essence are quite high up the list as well. They're quite strong, but they're, they're small, the blue menus that I showed last. Um, so those are sort of the relative concentrations of the Australian ones. Cubensis is sort of somewhere in the middle. It's not an exceptionally strong one, but it's certainly not weak like Alitasia or something like that. Okay, I've probably got time for one, maybe two more. Um, <laughs> these questions, once again, are directed at other species of mushrooms which are legal to pick out of the ground. Um, if I was hypothetically um, to pick some mushrooms, some wood-loving mushrooms, um, and just put them on some underneath some wood chips in my backyard. Would that would they then potentiate themselves or grow? Yep. Um, so that sort of transplant cultivation. A lot of people will cut the mycelium off the bottom. So if you after you pull it out, take the mycelium off the bottom of the mushroom, collect some of that, and either put it onto cardboard, wet cardboard. Um, and then put the cardboard, once it's colonised, under something. I don't know whether you'd be sort of touching on the, the wood lovers. Um, or, or putting them straight in the wood chip, I have seen work. But um, yeah, in, in short, yes, you can do it. There are um, instructions online that can sort of show you the details. Uh, we might have to leave it there so we have a bit of time to set up for the next talk, because um, that's going to take a few minutes to do. So. Uh, should, let's I just wanted to get one question in, if that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm very curious, Simon, as to um, whether these species are native, and obviously I suspect um, Cubensis to have been introduced with either pastoralists or mm. herbies. Um, but the other wood lovers, are they native? Subs are thought to be native. Subreginose is thought to be native. Um, it's in the old growth forest down in Tasmania and it, it, it isn't found anywhere else, as far as I know. Um, Cubensis may have been here earlier, they may have been brought with them, we really don't know. Um, they, sort of similar mushrooms are found in Southeast Asia, so there's you know some concept that they may, they've been in this area anyway, um, but yeah, when they brought pasture animals over, they may have brought Cubensis um, with them as well. And, and, Cyan essence is probably the same story. They're found in Indonesia, um, so they may have been here originally, or they may have been introduced as well. Um, but subreginose are native. On a, on a quick side note, the edible mushrooms are almost all, or the most common edible mushrooms that you'll pick are almost all introduced. Um, so from a conservation perspective, it's, you know, don't be afraid to get out and pick the, the edible ones, not that you should be overly worried about it anyway, but just in case. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. Big round of applause.